introduce you now. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Belfast Free Library's Solar Workshop Series Part 2 with Revision Energy. And tonight we have uh, and Revision Energy Solar Design Specialist Will, Fe Will Field here to talk about retrofitting and new construction. And just a real quick reminder, we have two additional programs coming up in April. On April 11th, the topic is solar and storage. And on April 25th, it's on Community Solar 101. So I hope you can join us then. Um, okay, Will, you have your mic on yet? To push the button till it's green. Give it a second. Give it a second to there warm up. There you are. And get to levels. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming on this dreary evening. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and thank you to Belfast Library for hosting such an important series. And so we appreciate it. And I'm glad to add what little what little I know to the to the general conversation. So I appreciate you guys coming out. Uh, my name is Will. I moved to Belfast seven years ago to work for Revision Energy. Uh, before that, I was a solar installer in the greater Portland area for a company that competes against Revision. So I've gone from a small company to a slightly larger company. We're about, we're medium sized, I'd say. We started here in Belfast. We have about 60 people that work out of Montville. Um, and in the region, we have about three, three about 400 people who work for us, and we are a 100% employee-owned company. Um, founded in 03, we've done about 10,000 systems uh, throughout the regions we work. So that's a little bit about me and a little bit about us. So what is a solar design specialist? I drive all over the state, and I meet lots of homeowners. I drive, about, I drive in about a two-hour radius north east, south, and west. And then the, we split the state around the Kennebec. So um, I, I work with homeowners and we design projects, come up with plans to get homes off of fossil fuels. That's sort of what we do every day, um, primarily through solar energy, but also through supplemental technologies like heating systems, which we'll dip into um, hot water systems and battery storage systems. There's sort of a suite of offerings. And here they are. This is a nice handy graphic that sort of thinks about an all electric solar powered home. And how do you get there? You know, you think about the areas of the home that use fossil fuels and how do you supplant them, replace them, slowly phase them out so that you slowly wean yourself off of gas, petrochemicals, and the utility top-down infrastructure of them feeding you fuel and you using it. So we start with, and we'll, we'll go into some of these topics in more depth, but we have heat pumps. Those provide zone heating. You know, they, they move warm air around a space even when it's below zero, well below zero out. So you target your heating system first and then your water system, you know, a typical blue tank that sits in your basement for a four person household will use three to 400 gallons of oil per year. So think of like those 50 gallon drums, you know, there would be this entire corner of them would be used in a typical home to heat the water. So you supplant that infrastructure with a tank that uses electricity. So it's there and you have decarbonized, that's sort of a fancy term of, of replacing and switching out things that burn things for things that don't burn things. So you have water heating, and then so now you have your heat and your hot water created by electricity, and now it's time to generate your own electricity, which will kind of be the primary focus of my talk tonight. So here's, here's a few more scary graphics. This is sort of a one of those sobering graphics that takes, imagine like all the trash and recycling that you create in a year and imagine if it were sort of put in one place. Here's the typical fossil fuel footprint of a New England home. And this says 800 gallons of oil per year, which 
based on what I see through homes for zone heating and hot water, that's that's fairly typical. Um, so not trying to doom and gloom you or say we're going towards a carbon cliff. You know, that's that's for somebody else for somebody for another night. But what I want to impart to you guys is to give you sort of, all right, now what? Where do we go and what do we do with our homes? So so that's where we that's where we go. So this is me. Uh, this is me in Belfast about three years ago. We live on Cedar Street. I moved to town to work in clean energy. Uh, this is my partner, Allison. She works in seaweed. This is our home. It's an 1890s colonial, and uh, it doesn't have any fossil fuel heating infrastructure in it. So there is, it, we bought it with no central heat plant, and we took out the so we're sort of trying to walk the walk. You know, can you heat a New England home in northern New England without fossil fuels? I'm trying to do it. So, so that's that's me. This is my dog Chip. So you might have noticed a solar array on top of my roof. Those are right on Cedar Street, and they generate about ten to eleven thousand units of clean energy per year. So that's basically replacing my electric bill with energy that's harvested right on that rooftop. So here's, and this will make a little bit more sense at the end, I'm guessing, I'm sort of throwing you right in the deep end, but this is sort of how it performs throughout the day and it sort of makes sense of it. So here's, here's one of my favorite graphs. This shows a home using energy throughout you know, this is 6 a.m. This is the coffee maker kicking on. And then this is the start of a sunny day. So the sun is coming out of the sky and it's those panels are starting to really crank right around midday. And then they cruise from about 10 to two. I'm creating clean energy. It's covered, the blue is, everything that's in the house is being solar powered. And then at night, it goes to bed and I continue my, you know, this is probably fridge and dehumidifier and things of that, of that nature, you know, charging a phone, your, your typical, you live your life here and then your solar energy shows up every day. Um, this is a tally of, you know, how much energy was created on this day. I created 63 units of energy and I use 23. So I carry forward with a balance of 40. So not all days look like that. That's, this is a, a low heating month and a sunny day, which is not most days, as we can tell. Um, so this, to make kind of sense of this, because this is a little bit foreign to a lot of people, you know, they just have an automatic payment for their utility bills and it just goes, make it go away. Let me throw money at it. So they, most people don't really think about their energy consumption. But this, to make sense of this, I would look at your most recent utility bill and you can tell like monthly, you know, energy that was used in a month, energy that was used per day and start. I think that's a, that's a good first step. Start to familiarize yourself with, with your energy usage so that when you create it, you kind of know, kind of know what, how it's performing relative to that. So really quickly, this is a layout of the solar panels themselves. This is the central inverter. I'll get to all that. I know that sounds really techy, but this is this map sort of transposed over here onto a daily, onto a monthly basis. So as you can see, sunny day, sunny day, you know, lousy day here. You know, this is some days it'll perform, some days it won't. And then this is an annual graph. So you might see, you see different colors for different years. So you see it's pretty consistent. You know, here's a bunch of Aprils all stacked together. And you can see April 2019 was a pretty rainy one. And summer, it kind of does, uh, it's up here. In the winter, it's kind of down here. But you can kind of see the overall consistency and predictability of it year over year. So that was a lot of information all at once. I'll make sense of it, I promise. And, and this is kind of, why why one would do it in addition to the 
carbon offsetting goals, you know, you're becoming a power plant. So basically the energy that I give away down the street, it, that is credited to my account because I'm helping the utility. They do not have to purchase as much energy on their side of things um, because I'm giving it away to their neighbors. So this is, you know, a very low bill. That's the minimum meter charge, which is an, a 100% solar powered month. So here's kind of the guts of my presentation. This is what I call 10 tips for a smooth solar installation. The prompt of this evening was retrofits and new construction. This kind of applies to both. You know, if you're thinking about a ground up new build, I'll sort of think linearly from the roof down to the electric system and out to the street is essentially what a solar energy system does. It creates energy and either uses it or gives it away. Um, so here we go. First, this might be review, but I wanted to point out some quick nomenclature that we use and different types of solar energy systems. Because we often get people at events and they say, okay, revision energy is here. I would like to buy some lead acid batteries, please. I would like to put them in my, you know, re replenish my battery bank. That would, would uh, apply to an off-grid system. So you might be familiar with what an off-grid system is. You know, if you ever go to White Mountain National Park or any of the park service, you know, you have, for a lot of people in Waldo County actually live off grid. People on boats live off grid. It's if it is prohibitively difficult to get the utility to you, people get batteries, solar, you know, you have all three of these things, roof, solar modules, batteries, and no grid interconnection. You are literally creating energy and using it in real time and storing it. It is quite a lifestyle shift, as anybody who's lived off grid can tell you. You know, you have to be ready to fix things. You have to be ready to run out of energy. And usually you have different methods of heating, refrigeration. You know, you have redundancies in a lot of different fields. So that's off grid. Revision energy started in that field. As we scaled up, we realized that's not really a market we can serve well. Um, we still have legacy customers who are off grid, but we are primarily in grid tide land in which most people do the rooftop solar or different types of solar I'll get into. They are a power plant. They exchange energy with the grid and they have no battery. So that's a very common thing that to impart as, as we design and set at customer expectations is that most of these systems unless you pair it with a battery, it is like any other appliance in the home in that you will, when the, when the local power grid goes out, it will shut off. You know, it's like a toaster oven. You can't use it when the power is off. Um, so that ties us to grid tied with a battery backup. So that's when we have a solar energy system on a roof connected to the grid. And when the power goes out, there is a transfer switch and a battery system. They come in sizes like small, medium, and large. And they will carry you through a sustained outage. We've had, just last week, we had lots of people who lived, lived by means of their ener stored energy system. So again, off-grid. Grid tide is primarily what I'll talk about tonight with my toe being dabbled in grid tied with battery backup. I'll reference that a few times, but that's sort of what we're talking about. And we will have a Q&A at the end. So if anybody has a burning question, try to wait till the end. But... So another, another tangent before we get to the meat of my, of, our, of my talk, you know, what are we talking about? What are we building? We start with the most iconic and famous and presentable part of the energy system, the panels. Um, they're like, I, I equate them to like windshields of a car. 
you know, they're tough, they're rugged. You could probably throw a baseball at them and they probably won't break uh, unless you throw it really hard. But um, they are tempered glass with cells in them, with bus bars in them. And when light hits them, they create electricity. They mount to the roof, different roof types, which I'll get into in a second. There are rails, flag attachments, and you basically just lay them on and fasten them. Right about here where they butt together, you would have a sort of a fastener hold them to that rail system. And that is designed to, designed to hold them through 100 mile an hour winds. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll have a wind tolerance. And if you're in a higher wind area, like say Bahamas or something like that, where they get hurricane force winds, they'll either add more attachments or add more hardware. So more different types of roofing. Um, so we saw asphalt. Here we see metal. This is our favorite type because you see how seam, you know, literally seamless it is. You just clamp right to the array or right to the roofing system. There's no penetrations. Both of those systems will probably outlast me. And then you have electronics. Um, this allows you to kind of read what's going on. It allows you to troubleshoot it. And it allows these systems to perform at their most efficient, despite environmental um, conditions, most notably snow and cloud cover. So here we have sort of snow down here. You know, these, these guys are barely doing anything, but the snow's falling off here, and these ones are doing OK. You know, there's a little clump here, but you can, you can kind of tell based on how they're, how they're performing. And I could, I could read that if I wanted to. Most of the time, you will probably ignore this, and it's an app on your phone that you might have to log into every time you, you open it. But this is available, and it's meant to serve you. And lastly, we have kind of the brains, the quarterback. These are the power plant itself. These devices, this is called an inverter, will take DC energy from the roof, funnel it through this box, and out comes AC energy, which we, we use in our homes and we use in our grids. And we've already touched on this a couple of times, but system monitoring, checking out what it's doing. And here we go. So a couple of detours. Now we're back. Any questions or anything? Is this all making sense? Sure. Yep. More, yeah, yeah, more often than not, you know, what's cost effective and what scale do we need to meet? Um, it's kind of a question of, of budget, you know, it's, which I, I don't want to get too far into what do these things cost tonight. If you're curious, absolutely give us a call and look into, you know, have somebody sort of custom tailor it to, to you. That's what we do all day long. You know, I did two visits today. Um, more often than not, the most cost-effective thing is just use the space you have. You know, if, uh, if you have a rooftop, you know, measure it, figure out how many panels will fit up there. You don't see, you see mostly full rooftops throughout Belfast. You know, you don't often see sort of, you know, you're not threading a needle, so to speak. You know, it's most cost-effective to scale the system up and just build based on what's there. Uh, we can talk after if, we, if, this, if that makes sense. Um, so here's some tips I've learned along the way. And this I put right at the top because it's deceptively simple. You know, it's deceptively complex. A lot of people will build their perfect dream home and the home that they want to face towards the sun and get all the light throughout the day. They put a lot of things on it. So skylights, vent stacks, chimneys, things like that. You know, the best solar installations happen on simple, rectangular, spacious roofs. It can be 
it's a lot of a lot of times that's missed, but those are our, our favorite installations. And we get this question a lot, you know, where do we point it? Where do we, what's the best direction for, you know, where do I point my roof so that I get the most solar energy possible? And I answer this one of two ways. One's a little nerdy, and that's you take a pocket compass, set it to 196, and then point it there. You know, 196 being true south where we're standing. Um, second way I answer it that's a little simpler is, you know, where does the sun set? You know, the average homeowner will say, right there. Yeah. Where does the sun rise? Right there. Got it backwards. But now you split the difference. You know, that is where you will see the most amount of energy throughout the day. Um, and this, it kind of tracks here. Here you have June sunshine at a very high arc, December sunshine at a very low arc. So here we have our planned solar roof, and it points roughly towards, roughly split, splits the difference between early and late. We have a, a factor of distance from the tree line, uh, which I'll get into in another slide. And this is a very dense slide that'll make your eyes hurt, but what I'm going for here is, here we have angle, you know, how steep is it? And here we have east, west, where are you on that spectrum? So it really doesn't matter all that much. You know, people stress and sweat about it. You know, am I true south? You know, as long as you're somewhere in this region, you'll do just fine. And as you go over here and start to lose more energy due to a flatter roof, due to snow cover, and then we, over here we have very, very east facing or you know north facing north northwest facing you know it's we, there is a spectrum of cost effective to not cost effective that's what that slide is telling you and then this is just distance from the tree line so so far on this point we've covered keep it simple keep it away from trees point it towards the sun simple sunny south And this I like to show, this is that planned project, and here it is completed. This is in, in Waldeboro. That was a guy's shop. Beautiful project. And I tangent again, build a roof if you don't have any of those factors going for your roof. These are some of my favorite projects. These are people who didn't have a good solar roof, so they made one. You know, here's a shed. This is in Hope. This is a 1830s barn, and he built a tractor, tractor snow cover. This is in Union, and that's that's a beautiful pergola, and you can see solar rays up there. You can get creative, and we love to help you with that. And then you've seen these around. This is a ground array. You know, if, if roof or second roof, if that's not an option, you can site them right on the ground. They use helical piles, you know, very large screws that go into the ground. Ledge can be dealt with. You can make your own canvas. Number two, run a pipe through it. So this is, you know, create the path from the roof down to the utility center. That will make everybody's lives a lot easier. This is, shout out to Brian for bringing the solar deck what we have here is a giant pizza box. I don't know if I can open it, but this goes under your roofing and then solar wires terminate in here and then they'll travel through your home and down to your load center or down to the inverter. So here we have that solar deck in action. Notice that the flange is under the roof. Here's rip, the underside of it. You have a chase going through the roof itself. And now you have a common, you know, a, a wires going through a common wall. They get to the inverter, which you, you learned about a few slides ago. And now they go outside to the meter. And there's a few shutoffs, which we'll talk about in a minute. Another thing people do to save money on a solar project, let's say 
you know, building a house is expensive and complicated and takes a very long time. You can install conduits. You know, here's two because conduits are relatively inexpensive. And we came to this home five years after it was built and we just used them as a, a chase from the attic down to the utility center. So it's, you can future proof, your, proof yourself by running a pipe through it. And another sort of deceptively simple one, number three, energy stuff needs space and access. You know, you need to be able to get somewhere. And it generally makes it easier if things like your meter, your load set, your, your electric panel, your generator system, makes it a lot easier if they're all together because um, then you're, you're future proofed for changes or additional systems. It generally makes things a lot easier. So. Give us space. We typically need about six feet of wall space, as you can see from these systems. Some things can go outside. Some things cannot. This is a Tesla battery. It needs to be in a warm space. But a lot of stuff can go right outside. So keep it together. Give us some room to work. Generators. Lots of people have generators, and especially after recent storms like we just had. They are thrilled to have them. We work with generator systems all day long. It's very common. We always need to be upstream. Generators must be downstream. So we tie in on the other side of what the generator will see. So just remember, if you're building a house, and you're, or if you have a house with a generator, we'll always try to get to the generator and then leapfrog it. So get between the meter and the generator itself. So this one sort of touches on the last two topics. You know, thinking ahead for batteries. Generators are an aging technology, and you know, they've been around for a hundred years. And we're starting to slowly see the battery market mature, and more and more people are installing them in their homes. You know, they went from a kind of a niche thing and now they're kind of getting mainstream. Um, more and more people are thinking about them during the design stage. A lot of people will skip over them and they might, you know, my parents, for example, got a solar array, but instead of a, a battery system, they got a generator. Don't, don't tell my bosses I told you that, but that's totally fine. But I think it's wise to think about Disconnects outside, which I'll get to in a minute, and just general space. Think about batteries. There are choices that one can make. Number six, make it easy to shut everything down, shut everything off. What you're seeing here are meters and exterior switches. This is for a solar energy system. This is for a battery. So when first responders show up, all they have to do is flip all, the, all of these switches and that will turn everything off. So those are required by National Electric Code and Fire Codes. So if we're at a beautiful new build, I'll say, do we have room outside for a shutoff switch? It's about the size of a shoebox. Check that one off the list. So make it easy to shut everything down from an easy point of view. Number seven, mind the transformer and the utility permit. We are, you are entering their landscape. You are entering their rules. The utility is your dance partner. You will exchange energy with them. You will be on their infrastructure. Um, in most cases, it's very simple. Um, in some cases, an upgrade might be prompted depending on the size of the system that can add some minor costs. It can add some headaches, but Think about permitting with the utility, because that's a big factor. And another offshoot, think about permitting with the town. So the utility and the town are kind of the big players who set the rules by which you have to work with. Thank you for listening so far. This is the seventh inning stretch. This is my dog, Chip. This is him when I'm working, he gets a little feisty. Um, so we talk about clean energy goals 
and getting your home off fossil fuels, I'm going to make a quick tangent about our favorite tools for getting you there, which are heat pumps. You know, heat pumps will keep you comfortable, they will keep your thermostat happy, and they will allow your existing system to not be needed. They'll relegate it to the back seat. So heat pumps are deceptively complex, so I wanted to share some wisdom we've gained over the years about them. This is an upstairs unit. You notice the it sort of fits in that, that area. That's a floor-mounted unit. I wanted to share that one because a lot of people don't know they exist, but they are wonderful. So number one, zoning and airflow are key. You know, you kind of want to put them in a nice large area. You know, one unit right there would probably heat all of us, probably cool all of us. I like to think about, you know, where does the homeowner spend their time? Where do I spend my time? You know, this is breakfast time, this is Netflix time, you know, this is sleep time, this is work time. You think about where you spend your time, and that will help you sort of guide your design process for retrofitting a clean energy heat heating system. Connect the dots. You know, these systems have indoor units, which you've seen. Well, here's their sort of business end. You have refrigerant piping that runs kind of kind of in a loop. You know, you have energy that comes from the outdoor unit and it delivers heat inside and then it returns and then it starts the process all over again. So you have an indoor unit, an outdoor unit. You do have to think about how you mount the outdoor unit and then you have an electrical run. So all of those pieces kind of need to be considered as we're designing these systems. And generally shorter, simpler is almost always better. Redundancy is good, just based on our current heat pump technology and good practice and good user feedback. It's generally better to put all of these zones on their own outdoor units, as you see here. You know, give each system its own controls, its own brain. They do operate a bit more efficiently, and efficiency main rebates do reflect that. You know, they do give you rebates for single zone heat pumps, but not multi-zone heat pumps, which we can talk about sort of on the side. But redundancy is good, and that gives you it gives you a lot of benefits. It also gives you a bit more heat. If one system needs to be serviced, you do have others as serving as backup. So number four, controls are the key to getting the most out of these systems. Run all year round, even at 10 below. You know, Don't be like my parents who turn it off just because they see a weather forecast that they don't like. You know, they are designed to work down to, they're rated down to negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit, and they can work at whatever temperature we throw at them. And then they will, there will be a sliding scale down to which they will stop working at a very low temperature that we will probably not get here. But run them all year round. They are designed to do that. Set to comfort not habit, and that's a counterintuitive one because people will say, you know, my heat pump is not heating my living room the way I expected it to. And then we say, well, what are you setting it at? And they say 68, because that's what I set my old system to. And we say, well, you got to bump it up. And so that, that's sort of a leap for a lot of people is you have to set it to what you're feeling and divorce yourself from what, the, what the, the reading temperature tells you. So you have to crank them up to meet, meet the temperature that you want, and they will operate just fine. You are not going to see a huge electric bill. They will operate just as they should. Fan speed equals heat. So a lot of times people will turn down, you know, somebody's watching TV, they will turn down their heat, their heat pump fan so they can hear the TV a little better. I'd say it sounds a little bit like a laptop. You know, that's kind of their, what their sound profile sounds like. If you forget to turn the fan back up, it's not going to blow air around the room so well. So you're going to 
it's going to be a little cold in the room. And then this is probably the most important mantra I want to impart about heat pumps is leave them alone. You know, don't turn them down at night like you used to with the old oil systems. You want them to leave, leave the, the warm air flowing and they operate very, very little once the room is up to temperature. So it's sort of like a slow cooker. They will use a very little bit of energy and just keep the temperature up to speed. You want them to have momentum. So for that reason, set and forget. Um, efficiency main user tips. Um, they have them right online. We give them with every heat pump installation. They are excellent. And I borrowed a lot of these from there. And last one before we dip back into solar land. Supplemental heat is good. So, you know, airflow is key. You know, they are things that blow warm air. Well, there are lots of very small areas that might be challenging to get to. So we have resistive electric heat. You know, this is smart to put in rooms. This is radiant tile heat. You know, these sort of snap in like Legos. And then there's a thermostat that keeps the warm, nice, the, the room, the bathroom nice and warm. And then wood heat. You know, that's, I think that's an excellent pairing. You know, it's like wine and cheese, you know, wood stove and um, wood stove and heat pumps because the wood stove will pick up the slack throughout the day and then the heat pumps will pick up the slack at night or during a, a power outage. So thank you guys again for listening. Um, any questions so far about, we'll keep the question specifically to heat pumps. Any thoughts, questions? Yes, Brian. They work beautifully, but I have the test features. I, I set them at 64 degrees instead of 90 because my 11 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning, I, I throttle them down. And that's all I do it on gas. And then at 6 o'clock in the morning, I have them set to go at 74. I like a nice 68 degree room at 74 degrees. My heat pump feels like 68 degrees instead of. Um, would you recommend just letting them just setting that thermostat at 74 degrees and 24 7? Or is there any value to letting them kind of set it or cool off? Do you save that? I would. Yeah, sorry. So Brian's question was Brian sets them on a timer from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m., they go to a lower temperature. And then the, during the day, they, they ramp up and meet a, a higher temperature. And is that wise or should he set it at, at the, the proper, at the higher temperature? I set mine and they cruise. I don't, if I go away for two days, I don't even turn them off. I don't, I, I think they work more efficiently and I'm more comfortable in my home if I just let them cruise. So I, I think you, they would cycle less, you know, they're not, they're not going to be climbing up 10 stairs every morning to to go from 64 to 74. I think air will be distributed better and I think you'll have lower energy bills, but that's me and my ivory castle. I think try it out, you know. Yep. Yep. Or more. Yep. But I, I never feel that I need to crank it up to need that heat lamp. It just makes the job quiet. That's awesome. I tell people that they're a little quirky and they will take some getting used to. And every home's a little bit different. So if your system meeting your needs at quiet, that's awesome. You know, that's every over every home's a little different. Show it show of hands. Does anybody have heat pumps besides Brian? So good chunk of the audience. Any discord? Do you agree, disagree? It's a new house to us, and it's it's a challenge to figure out how to yeah. set it. We can set it up and set yep. down. And we can tell oh you can probably shut it off now, but not today. Yep. It's really cold. 
And so it's been matters that we need to, but if we do have this uh, increase and decrease, are we, um, so we're not running a heat pump as efficiently as they could. They should be left alone, but not to draw in more hours running. I, it is, and don't take my word for it, Efficiency Maine, and it was my anecdotal experience. They say that they will, uh, they will use less electricity if they are asked to do one thing versus asking to do different things at different times of day. And it's very counterintuitive for people. And it takes months of getting used to, possibly years of getting used to, but I found it to be true. Um, I had to go against my spousal green to get there but you know it's I, I i hold that to be true but try it out you know um all right back to our presentation quick review of all the things that will make your solar project smooth and wonderful keep it south simple sunny run your pipe through it if you're building it from scratch Everything that we do needs about six feet of wall space. Generators, we got to get to the generator. We got to leapfrog it. Think ahead for batteries. Ask your installer if there's any considerations about future batteries. Six, be ready to shut it off easily outside. And seven, utility permitting, town permitting, mind the transformer size. So moving right along, yes. We do. Most, yeah, most installers do just to get those good Google reviews and make it easy, you know, because nobody wants to deal with permitting. Um, internet connection, all of these systems, every interface that you've seen from a user level is connected to the internet. So it's very, very important. Um, a lot of products come with cellular packages, you know, if internet's not available, say it's like a a lake house or some, a place that doesn't normally have internet. Um, but through, through any different means, either through wireless connection, hardwired connection, you got to hook, hook these devices up to the internet. Number nine, system expansions. They can be elegant with adequate space and planning. Um, this one we deal with quite a bit. You know, somebody, you know, here we have different systems. They're about 10 years apart. So you can see for in, in different scenarios, typically needs change. A lot of times people will get an electric vehicle and all of a sudden they're using a little bit more energy than they were creating or than they are creating. You know, they sort of move the goalposts on themselves. Uh, through the pandemic, a common story was adult children moved home. Um, and, and now it more, you know, more loads of laundry are happening. System expansions do happen. Um, I think the most elegant way to do it and most cost-effective way to do it is to just put a parallel system right next to it if the roof space allows. But usually the more cost-effective approach, and this is a plug for my colleague Kevin next week, he will talk about off-site solar. So this is in Knox, Maine. These are co-owners, people who helped pay for this project, and they benefit from the solar energy really no differently as if it were on their respective roofs. So I think it's a wonderful program. So if you if we go out to your site and it's in the middle of the woods, and you have these beautiful hardwoods covering your, giving you shade all day long, and you don't want to remove them, this is your answer to meeting those clean energy goals and meeting those energy savings goals. So off-site, I call it member-owned cooperative solar, which is a wonderful mechanism. Um, it's a topic of next week's talk. And then last one, don't wait. You know, people oftentimes will do this and wish they'd done it years prior. Energy savings will start instantly and these systems will last for a multi-generational period of time. You know, we're tip talking typically 30 to 40 year expected lifespan. And we have seen that, you know, typically 
older systems, they, they last a very long time. And panels, they will plateau at about 80% of their output from the first day they were installed. And that, that plateau usually comes about 25 years, and then they'll cruise for um, another 15 years. So that's about it. You know, this was a lot, you know, this was kind of the what can we do and how can we do it talk and how can we retrofit, how can we build from scratch. All of this is possible, all of this is available. People do heat their homes without fossil fuels and that's, and that's how. So here's a review and here's me. Thank you for listening, that's, that's my chat. Any questions? <laughs> We, I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you Will. The questions are best heard on the recording. If we use the mic, I'm sorry. Hi, my my system is my system is a um, hot water radiator system. Yeah. In the basement, of course, and a co constant hot water supply. Yeah. Um. I'm interested in in doing this, but I don't want to lose the comfort of the radiator heat and especially the all the time hot water. Um, are there products that are available on the electrical side that can replace the mechanics I have on the propane side for those systems? or would or is it only heat pumps and only water tanks? So you have a solar thermal system? No, I don't. Oh, you have a, a hydronic system in the, in the so, oh, oh, I see what you're asking. Are, are there heat pump systems that heat hydronic pipes existing infrastructure? I, if, I don't know what a hydronic Hydronic, pipe like the copper pipes that, that heat the floor or heat radiators. The radiators, yep. yes. So short answer is they exist in Europe. They exist in a very, very small market in Canada. I've seen one in Belfast. We are very early to that party. So what we install as a, so short answer is they exist, but they're not very common. So that's, uh, that's where we live in that landscape. I think it's a very exciting opportunity. You know, I think that's where it's gonna go in the next 10 years, you know, cause somebody, you know, think about it, a heating system in a home, it's, a bunch of pipes that are already there and they already work pretty well. So why not just replace the heart of that system and put it there? I think it's a wonderful idea and I think we are going there, but we're a little early. <laughs> Good question I have, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, my house is, um, the, the roofs are east-west. Yeah. There's no, no real true south. Um, is that an issue? And, and would we be able to use the west side roof as well as the east side roof? Yeah, we do that all the time. I think as, you know, it kind of goes back to this very dense and boring graph. Um, so short answer is yes. Um, excuse me a sec, or I'll just throw it here. So do east would be azimuth angle degrees east or west of due south. So here we are, 90 degrees off of south. So you are, you're about three, you're about 75% as effective as a, a panel that's in optimal conditions. So another way I phrase it to people is for what 10 panels can create in optimal conditions, you need about 13 on an east-west roof. So people see that and they say, heck yeah, you know, that will meet my goals, that meets my budget, let's do it. So short answer is yeah, we do use east-west roofs all the time. Um, one of my favorite, I won't do it now, but um, if you Google Bar Harbor Public Works Building, you know, that's like, you, it, the Google drops you right on satellite image of a big salt shed and it's one array is due east, one array is due west. Um, so it works. I think as long as you have sunshine, it'll work. You know, if it's shaded, I, it probably wouldn't work. 
Yeah. I think it's viable. Any other questions? Uh, I'm about to uh, install a roof, so I'm curious about your comment about like, it looked like a raised seam or a, uh, that's your preferred roofing material because we're going to do metal. So. Yep. Uh, standing seam is our standing favorite. Seam, um, I think it's it's beautiful. You know, you see it on houses. I think it, it, it I can't, I'm not a roofer, so I, th I think it does last the longest. You know, we're talking 100 year increments. Um, it's a thicker gauge than thin gauge or screw down metal. That's another type of metal. Um, we can make any, the sort, the only roofs we really don't, we cannot install on are slate and cedar shakes. You know, those just shatter and break and we can't leak proof them. Um, asphalt shingle is probably a third of the cost of standing seam metal. So standing seam is awesome, but it is also very expensive. Um, one, you know, it's, it's like buying the next three roofs because it'll outlast an asphalt shingle by about that factor. Um, so usually we, I think most of our day-to-day -day work is asphalt shingle. Corrugated metal is a little bit more challenging, um, but standing, standing seam is our favorite, but asphalt shingle is just fine. And then, and then, what's the differential between ground co in cost for ground mounted versus roof mounted? Sure, um, differential. And I, I should repeat the question. I haven't been doing that. <laughs> oh, uh, silly me. Um, they are bigger projects. You know, if you think about a ground mounted system, they are you, a roof mounted system. One team of people will show up at your home and install what they're supposed to install right on your roof, right on your, in your utility space. A ground mounted system, you have three teams coming. You have one team will, they drive a, basically a small tractor um, to the site and they'll put a rectangle, you know, it's very loud. Um, they'll put seven foot screws in the earth. They hit ledge, which in Maine, they always do. They'll put a diamond tip on the bit and they'll just grind away the rock until we get to a, the right depth. Um, so that's, you know, the feet go on, they're about knee high. Um, they're very common. You know, you see helical piles for like decks and greenhouses and porches, you know, they're very, they're, they're everywhere. Um, I think they're elegant, they're, there's no concrete involved. Um, so that's step one. Step two is that you use much larger racking um, for, for the installation itself. Let me see if I could get some photos. Um, so you use larger racking and then you build it and then you got to trench it. So typically we want to stay, this one I really like. So this racking, you know, it's about 12 feet tall. So that's probably step one that I want to impart to people is, do you know how big this is? You know, it's 12 feet tall. It's about waist high to stay out of the snow. Um, and then you have you know, in this case, you walk back to the where it needs to go. It's probably 200 feet. Um, that's about our range. Any more than 200 feet, it starts to get, you know, you have to upsize the wire. So wire gets really expensive and it gets really difficult to pull it. So long way of answering your question of what's the difference in cost. Uh, it's, I would say about 30% more. You know, if you take a comparable size roof mount, and then put it on the ground. Yeah, you're paying about 30% more. But where where it's not quite so simple as two choices in a vacuum, you know, roof versus ground. In most cases, you do not have the roof choice. You know, it's like a classic old farmhouse that has the hardwoods all the way up to the front stoop. You know, in a, a dormant farmhouse, you you a roof might not be viable, but they have, you know. A, a space of field just beyond where they mow where it, it works great you know and, and so that's that's sort of how we approach it and what the cost differential is because it's it's a larger project thanks any more questions yeah, I have sure no you can't <laughs> So this is in regards to excess energy. 
generation. Um, feeding it to the to the grid, right? Mm -hmm. I heard in the past, and this was like 10, 12 years ago, that CMP was then cutting a check or the, the utility company, whoever it was, was cutting a check back to the, the homeowner or the generator. Is that still the case or how is that all reconciled now? Um, it's basically an exchange. So you create a lot of energy, excuse me, when when you can, which is summer months. It gets it gets tallied in your electric bill. So you will see column A, which is what you have now, which is energy that flows in the building. And then when you go through the permitting process, they your bills look different. You will see what's flowing in the building, what's leaving the building. And then you'll see what I call the log pile, which is that, so basically the green in the graphics that I showed you, that gets tallied and that number gets really, really big, usually towards September. And then in September, it reverses direction. And usually people will start using more energy than they create. Um, so it's so to answer your question very succinctly, you're exchanging units of energy. Um, so is it then ever reconciled out? So if, if, I, if I put in a system that is much bigger than what I need, yep. because I want to help the, the world, right? I want to create more energy. Is that ever reconciled so that I get paid back for that, that I don't use over the course of the year? I'm not talking daily or weekly or monthly, yeah. but over a period of time. Um, unfortunately, no. You know, the, the rules in which we live, um, if you don't use energy credits within a year from when they're made, they do expire. So you actually see a column on your bill that says unused credits expiring. Um, most people, it doesn't populate. Um, so short answer is, un unfortunately, there's no value for people to overbuild. I think the value of, you know, somebody considering overbuilding, like your question earlier, you know, meeting the size of the roof r rather than really fine tuning the needs. Um, it costs, back to the, my ninth point of expansions, it is so much cheaper to build it once versus building it multiple times. So even if you lose a few credits, you know, say that's a value of $200, you know, you say per year that energy credits are expiring. You know, you're saving thousands of dollars by having an install team come once versus coming multiple times because people always, especially as we're talking about heat pumps and electric vehicles are becoming more and more common water tanks, which we didn't really talk tonight, talk about tonight, but people always find ways to use electricity. And if they don't, they sh typically share it with family members. You know, it's surprisingly easy to share, you know, I've seen parents and children share energy credits. Um, sometimes the array is built at the child's house and then they share credits with the parents or vice versa. Um, so back to your question, nobody's cutting you a check but it is that that's sort of the mechanism we live in is that energy is exchanged. That, you know, energy now for energy later. Did you have another question? Uh, sorry, I do have one more question. Fire away. Or, or over a, here for a number more questions, but this is pretty generic. Do you, do you have a sense of how many households in Belfast have solar? Um. Where, That's where a great we, question. Where are we on the curve? I don't know. I'd say Belfast as a whole is very ahead of the curve. You know, you think about, I think my colleague Matt talked about this last week. You know, if you talk about our, um, you know, our, look at our fire station, look at our landfill, look at Crocker Road, you know, walk down Bayview Street, walk down Union Street, walk down Cedar Street. You know, there's lots of, ins so our, our town is very close to net zero just because it's, I heard anecdotally, it's something like 80 meters that are energized through these central solar locations. Um, and they did it in stages. You know, I, yeah, I'd have to talk to some of my older colleagues, but I think over, I think 2015, it was a little over almost a decade ago, they did the landfill, you know, made use of a capped landfill. And then the fire station, uh, that's a corrugated metal roof. Um, and then the most recent one was the largest one, which is Crocker Road. So 
while thinking about this, this is a little bit of a tangent, but you know, you can do it in stages. Don't feel intimidated by all these heat pump options and solar options. You can do it a little bit at a time, and a lot of people do. You know, it's I think that's a really smooth way to do it. Make it easy on yourself. So I just want to interject. So sure. what you were talking about is the city's investment in solar. So we are benefiting from that right now. The library is part of the city. So I don't see our electric bill, but it makes me feel better knowing <laughs> that this building is um, run on solar energy. 80% of it, I've been told. So that's that's really great. Yeah. It's wonderful. I should know the answer to your question, but I don't. In terms of homeowners, <laughs> that that's kind of what your question was. It's, it's both, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to gather information sure. for, yeah. for the committee then. Uh, you know, there's getting to that kind of answer yeah. would be cool. Yeah. Just to see how far we could go. Sure. Any more questions? Well, thank you so much, Will. This was really helpful. Thank you, guys. Very Appreciate it. Thank you.